Um, so yes, uh, my name is Joshua Helpern. I'm a uh, PhD candidate in computer science at the University of Illinois, and this work is part of an ongoing project uh, with my advisor in computer science as well, um, and Drs. Laura DeThorne and Jim Halley in the departments of speech and hearing science and special education, respectively. Um, so this is a really interdisciplinary uh, project. Uh, and most of us here are researchers, and it, it's not uncommon that when we design a project, we, we start it off, we design the experiment, we figure out our dependent measures, and then as we're doing our analysis or writing our paper, we, we turn to ourselves or the advisor turns to the graduate student and said, why didn't we look at this other dependent measure? And usually the answer is, well, we need to go do another experiment, which is what your research is for the next semester. Um, but we had a, a really unique opportunity with uh, this project, uh, the one that we presented back in CHI this past spring uh, called Creating a Spoken Impact. And what we had is a large collection of video data that we were able to go back to and reanalyze from a different perspective. But getting back to the idea of this project and why I'm up here, which is we wanted to see if there was a way that computer systems could encourage vocalization in low-functioning children with autistic spectrum disorder. And one of the hallmark signs of autism is severe impairments in social interactions. And as a spectrum, you have individuals who are very high-functioning, and then you have individuals who are low-functioning. And low-functioning individuals with autism are a real extreme. They have not only difficulties with social interaction, but also difficulties with vocalization and language itself. And when you have these individuals with autism interacting with speech pathologists and humans, they have a high degree of anxiety and stress that comes from this human-to-human -human interaction. So we postulated, could a computer be used to encourage vocalizations and then maybe somewhere down the line in a therapeutic session actually teach language and uh, vocabulary skills? And specifically, we were looking at real-time compu uh, computer feedback. Um, this is where the, a, a child would vocalize and the computer would somehow present them new information through different modalities to give them a new understanding of their voice and also might act as a reinforcement to continue to vocalize. So we looked at two different types of modalities. We looked at visual feedback um, in which the vocalizations were represented well, visually. Um, we looked at 16 uh, different types of visual feedback and here's just one example which is of spheres moving around a spiral. Um, the volume of the vocalization is represented by the sphere size. The uh, time factor is represented by their movement around the circle. And each new utterance, each new vocalization is represented by a different color. And as, as I said, this is just one out of the si 16 that we were, I think it was 16, that we looked at in the paper. Um, the other modality was audio. And there's two different ways that you can present audio feedback. The, First way would be one-to-one -one audio. That's where uh, the child would start to make a sound and almost immediately afterwards the computer would start making a sound back. You can think of this as if you go into a large stairwell and you start making noise, you can hear that echo right away. So that's the type of one-to-one -one feedback that we presented. But we also used reward style feedback. And this is where I, start, I would eventually stop talking like I'm doing now. And that pause would allow the computer to then play back uh, audio from a TV show that the child may like or just music from maybe a pre-recorded xylophone. But the important thing here is that the duration of the vocalization was directly correlated with the duration of the reward sound. So as I made a longer vocalization, I would get a longer reward back at me. And we recorded the video from our experiment and we used video annotation to extract data and see how the children reacted in the presence of video and auditory feedback. And the conclusion of our CHI paper was that four out of five children increased their vocalization in the presence of some form of auditory or visual feedback. And we were really excited by this. Um, this was wonderful. We were jumping up and down. This was cool. Um, but like any good research paper, we had limitations. Uh, and the first thing is four out of five children is hardly a representative sample of anything more than four or five children. Um, but what we did is our initial idea was we wanted to teach language skills. We wanted to teach communication. But when we looked at the existing literature on autism, we realized that there wasn't a lot out there. And we had to repeatedly simplify and ask more and more basic questions until we actually got down to the question, do children with autism get 
visual f or auditory feedback on a computer? Will they engage in this modality? Will they engage with this kind of a system? So we needed to conduct a pilot study to just answer that basic premise. Going down this line of, of research, will children with autism engage with a computer feedback system? The second thing that uh, limited our study was that, or that we found out from our study, was that children have preferences. Which, I mean, if you put me in a room where, you know, with a comfy chair and some great jazz music, I will stay there for hours. But you change that to techno music, same comfy chair, and I'll be out of that room in about 30 seconds. I just can't stand techno. But there's this assumption uh, that ch all children with autism are the same. And this, this is pervasive, but it's not supported by sci scientific research. And what we found out is that children actually have preferences even if they have autism. And we saw that these preferences were across modalities. So some children like audio feedback, some children like visual feedback, and some children like mixed, so where there was audio and visual feedback. But even more interestingly, the, there were differences between the preferences of the children within each modality. So not all audio feedback got that child going. Not all visual feedback was stimulating to every single child who liked visual feedback. And the last limitation, and the one that I'm going to be focusing on here uh, today and in our paper, was the dependent measures that we looked at, which specifically were one. So we looked at spontaneous speech-like vocalizations. Um, which are vocalizations that a child may make that are phonetically based in Western language. The ah, b, k, d. We, 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 did, we filtered out things that were considered non-speech vocalizations, like a lip pop or a grunt or a scream. These are things that a speech pathologist wouldn't be able to shape later on into meaningful language. And we also looked at rate of these vocalizations. But who's to say, you know, what's better? Is it, is it better for a child to be vocalizing like this, where it's a lot of short vocalizations, which in our Kai paper we did look at, but is it, or is it better to do a couple of much longer vocalizations? Wh who's to say which is right? But the important thing about both the spontaneous speech-like vocalizations versus non-speech and rate versus duration is these are mutually exclusive. If I'm making speech-like vocalizations, I can't be screaming or making a grunt sound or a lip pop. It's just like if I'm doing a lot of short vocalizations, at that same time, I can't be doing uh, a fewer but longer vocalizations. So that's what we wanted to re-examine. Can we, what are the effects of computer-generated feedback on these other types of non-speech vocalizations, rate versus duration? So here was the uh, setup of our Kai paper, which is the exact same setup of this analysis, which was basically we had five kids coming into our uh, experimental setting. Each child attended six sessions, which started off with a baseline condition, which was when there was nothing on the computer screen. And then we exposed them to roughly eight uh, different permutations of auditory and visual feedback. And uh, we used video annotation to assess their vocalizations. And uh, this is a, just a quick video of one of our subjects. This is, his code name was Frank. Um, yeah, Frank. Uh, and him interacting with uh, one of our visualizations. So there you could see the, the, the visualization was responding to his vocalizations, and you could hear both the spontaneous speech, the, the speech-like vocalizations, but you could also hear those that were non-speech. You could hear that, that deep grunt that he had when he did that very heavy swallow. So once again, we're looking at speech-like vocalization rate, which I'm going to be abbreviating as SLVR, uh, speech-like vocalization duration, SLVD, and non-speech-like vocalization, uh, which is